Section One of A Guide to Stoicism by St. George William Joseph Stock. Section One Philosophy Among the Greeks and Romans and Division of Philosophy. Philosophy Among the Greeks and Romans. Among the Greeks and Romans of the Classical Age, philosophy occupied the place taken by religion among ourselves. Their appeal was to reason, not to revelation. To what, asks Cicero in his offices, are we to look for training in virtue, if not to philosophy? Now if truth is believed to rest upon authority, it is natural that it should be impressed upon the mind from the earliest age, since the essential thing is that it should be believed but a truth which makes its appeal to reason must be content to wait till reason is developed. We are born into the Eastern, Western, or Anglican Communion, or some other denomination, but it was of his own free choice that the serious-minded young Greek or Roman embraced the tenets of one of the great sects which divided the world of philosophy. The motive which led him to do so in the first instance may have been merely the influence of a friend or a discourse from some eloquent speaker. But the choice once made was his own choice, and he adhered to it as such. Conversions from one sect to another were of quite rare occurrence. A certain Dionysius of Heraclea, who went over from the Stoics to the Cyrenaics, was ever afterward known as the deserter. It was as difficult to be independent in philosophy as it is with us to be independent in politics. When a young man joined a school, he committed himself to all its opinions, not only as to the end of life, which was the main point of division, but as to all questions on all subjects. The Stoic did not differ merely in his ethics from the Epicurean, he differed also in his theology and his physics and his metaphysics. Aristotle, as Shakespeare knew, thought young men unfit to hear moral philosophy, and yet it was a question, or rather the question, of moral philosophy, the answer to which decided the young man's opinions on all other points. The language which Cicero sometimes uses about the seriousness of the choice made in early life, and how a young man gets entrammeled by a school before he is really able to judge, reminds us of what we hear said nowadays about the danger of a young man's taking orders before his opinions are formed. To this it was replied that a young man only exercised the right of private judgment in selecting the authority whom he should follow, and having once done that, trusted to him for all the rest, with the analogue of this contention also we are familiar in modern times. Cicero allows that there would be something in it if the selection of the true philosopher did not, above all things, require the philosophic mind. But in those days it was probably the case, as it is now, that if a man did not form speculative opinions in youth, the pressure of affairs would not leave him leisure to do so later. The lifespan of Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, was from B.C. 347 to 275. He did not begin teaching till 315, at the mature age of forty. Aristotle had passed away in 322 and with him closed the great constructive era of Greek thought. The Ionian philosophers had speculated on the physical constitution of the universe, the Pythagoreans on the mystical properties of numbers, Heraclitus had propounded his philosophy of fire, Democritus and Leucippus had struck out a rude form of the atomic theory, Socrates had raised questions relating to man, Plato had discussed them with all the freedom of the dialogue, while Aristotle had systematically worked them out. The later schools did not add much to the body of philosophy. What they did was to emphasize different sides of the doctrine of their predecessors, and to drive views to their logical consequences. The great lesson of Greek philosophy is that it is worthwhile to do right irrespective of reward and punishment, and regardless of the shortness of life. This lesson the Stoics so enforced by the earnestness of their lives, and the influence of their moral teaching, that it has become associated more particularly with them. Cicero, though he always classed himself as an academic, exclaims in one place that he is afraid the Stoics are the only philosophers, 
and whenever he is combating epicureanism his language is that of a stoic some of virgil's most eloquent passages seem to be inspired by stoic speculation even horace despite his banter about the sage in his serious moods borrows the language of the stoics it was they who inspired the highest flights of declamatory eloquence in perseus and juvenal their moral philosophy affected the world through roman law the great masters of which were brought up under its influence so all pervasive indeed was this moral philosophy of the stoics that it was read by the jews of alexandria into moses under the veil of allegory and was declared to be the inner meaning of the hebrew scriptures if the stoics then did not add much to the body of philosophy they did a great work in popularizing it and bringing it to bear upon life an intense practicality was a mark of the later greek philosophy this was common to stoicism with its rival epicureanism both regarded philosophy as the art of life though they differed in their conception of what that art should be widely as the two schools were opposed to one another they had also other features in common both were children of an age in which the free city had given way to monarchies and the personal had taken the place of corporate life the question of happiness is no longer as with aristotle and still more with plato one for the state but for the individual in both schools the speculative interest was feeble from the first and tended to become feebler as time went on both were new departures from pre-existent schools stoicism was bred out of cynicism as epicureanism out of cyrenaicism both were content to fall back for their physics upon the pre-socratic schools the one adopting the firm philosophy of heraclitus the other the atomic theory of democritus both were in strong reaction against the abstractions of plato and aristotle and would tolerate nothing but concrete reality the stoics were quite as materialistic in their own way as the epicureans with regard indeed to the nature of the highest god we may with seneca represent the difference between the two schools as a question of the senses against the intellect but we shall see presently that the stoics regarded the intellect itself as being a kind of body the greeks were all agreed that there was an end or aim of life and that it was to be called happiness but at that point their agreement ended as to the nature of happiness there was the utmost variety of opinion democritus had made it consist in mental serenity anaxagoras in speculation socrates in wisdom aristotle in the practice of virtue with some amount of favor from fortune aristippus simply in pleasure these were opinions of the philosophers but besides these there were the opinions of ordinary men as shown by their lives rather than by their language zeno's contribution to thought on the subject does not at first sight appear illuminating he said that the end was to live consistently the implication doubtless being that no life but the passionless life of reason could ultimately be consistent with itself cleanthes his immediate successor in the school is credited with having added the words with nature thus completing the well-known stoic formula that the end is to live consistently with nature it was assumed by the greeks that the ways of nature were the ways of pleasantness and that all her paths were peace this may seem to us a startling assumption but that is because we do not mean by nature the same thing as they did we connect the term with the origin of a thing they connected it rather with the end by the natural state we mean a state of savagery they meant the highest civilization we mean by a thing's nature what it is or has been they meant what it ought to become under the most favorable conditions not the sour crab but the mellow glory of the hesperides worthy to be guarded by a sleepless dragon was to the greeks the natural apple hence we find aristotle maintaining that the state is a natural product because it is evolved out of social relations which exist by nature nature indeed was a highly ambiguous term to the greeks no less than to ourselves but in the sense with which we are now concerned the nature of anything was defined by the peripatetics as the end of its becoming another definition of theirs 
puts the matter still more clearly. What each thing is when its growth has been completed, that we declare to be the nature of each thing. Following out this conception, the Stoics identified a life in accordance with nature with a life in accordance with the highest perfection to which man could attain. Now, as man was essentially a rational animal, his work as man lay in living the rational life, and the perfection of reason was virtue. Hence, the ways of nature were no other than the ways of virtue. And so it came about that the Stoic formula might be expressed in a number of different ways which yet all amounted to the same thing. The end was to live the virtuous life, or to live consistently, or to live in accordance with nature, or to live rationally. DIVISION OF PHILOSOPHY Philosophy was defined by the Stoics as the knowledge of things divine and human. It was divided into three departments, logic, ethic, and physic. This division, indeed, was in existence before their time, but they have got the credit of it as of some other things which they did not originate. Neither was it confined to them, but was part of the common stock of thought. Even the Epicureans, who are said to have rejected logic, can hardly be counted as dissentients from this threefold division. For what they did was to substitute for the Stoic logic a logic of their own, dealing with the notions derived from sense much in the same way as Bacon substituted his Novum Organum for the Organon of Aristotle. Cleanthes, we are told, recognized six parts of philosophy, namely dialectic, rhetoric, ethic, politic, physic, and theology. But these are obviously the result of subdivision of the primary ones. Of the three departments we may say that logic deals with the form and expression of knowledge, physic with the matter of knowledge, and ethic with the use of knowledge. The division may also be justified in this way. Philosophy must study either nature, including the divine nature, or man. And if it studies man, it must regard him either from the side of the intellect or of the feelings, that is, either as a thinking logic or as an acting ethic being. As to the order in which the different departments should be studied, we have had preserved to us the actual words of Chrysippus in his fourth book on lives. Quote, First of all, then, it seems to me that, as has been rightly said by the ancients, there are three heads under which the speculations of the philosopher fall, logic, ethic, and physic. Next, that of these the logical should come first, the ethical second, and the physical third and that of the physical the treatment of the gods should come last, whence also they have given the name of completions to the instruction delivered on this subject. End quote. That this order, however, might yield to convenience is plain from another book on the use of reason, where he says that, quote, the student who takes up logic first need not entirely abstain from the other branches of philosophy, but should study them also as occasion offers. End quote. Plutarch twits Chrysippus with inconsistency, because in the face of this declaration as to the order of treatment, he nevertheless says that morals rest upon physics. But to this charge it may fairly be replied that the order of exposition need not coincide with the order of existence. Metaphysically speaking, morals may depend upon physics, and the right conduct of man may be deducible from the structure of the universe. But for all that, it may be advisable to study physics later. Physics meant the nature of God and the universe. Our nature may be deducible from that, but it is better known to ourselves to start with, so that it may be well to begin from the end of the stick that we have in our hands. But that Chrysippus did teach the logical dependence of morals on physics is plain from his own words. In his third book on the gods, he says, Quote, for it is not possible to find any other origin of justice or mode of its generation save that from zeus and the nature of the universe for anything we have to say about good and evil must needs derive its origin therefrom End quote. and again in his physical theses 
quote, for there is no other or more appropriate way of approaching the subject of good and evil on the virtues or happiness than from the nature of all things and the administration of the universe. For it is to these we must attach the treatment of good and evil, inasmuch as there is no better origin to which we can refer them, and inasmuch as physical speculation is taken in solely with a view to the distinction between good and evil. End quote. The last words are worth noting as showing that even with Chrysippus, who has been called the intellectual founder of Stoicism, the whole stress of the philosophy of the porch fell upon its moral teaching. It was a favorite metaphor with the school to compare philosophy to a fertile vineyard or orchard. Ethic was the good fruit, physic the tall plants, and logic the strong wall. The wall existed only to guard the trees, and the trees only to produce the fruit or again philosophy was likened to an egg of which ethic was the yolk containing the chick, physic the white which formed its nourishment, while logic was the hard outside shell. Posidonius, a later member of the school, objected to the metaphor from the vineyard on the ground that the fruit and the trees and the wall were all separable, whereas the parts of philosophy were inseparable. He preferred, therefore, to liken it to a living organism, logic being the bones and sinews, physic the flesh and blood, but ethic the soul. End of section 1This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And End of a Guide to Stoicism Section 1 By St. George William Joseph 